Hello, welcome. This is our third series within the Made of Millions um, Understanding ERP Treatment Series. I'm here joined by Chrissy Hodges and Ethan Smith, both uh, OCD advocates and um, friends as well. Chrissy and Ethan, hello. Hey, Stephen, thanks for having us. I'm not, I'm not your friend. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Oh, that's right. Yeah, she doesn't. She doesn't have the last name Smith, so I'm not sure if she's. Really, yeah, she's not even part of this group. She's not. She's not part of the group. This is a family thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, thank you all again for joining. Thank you so, for the candle. Very nice ambiance. Yeah, yours as well. Is that a candle? That's a that's a salt lamp, actually. <laughs> Look, I have a banana. I know. <laughs> It's, it, it needs a lamp underneath it or a candle underneath it. Um, and lit banana. I like it. <laughs> I have another one over here, too. Look at that. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, that's the flaccid one. <laughs> <laughs> I may need to bring that down just so everybody knows what we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're not going to learn uh, anything today. We're just going to tangent an hour. <laughs> Welcome to the like I'm sweating already. <laughs> Yeah, my dog is sweating. She's listening to all this. Um, but hey, thank you all for joining. Today we're going to talk about OCD treatment, right? We talked in the last few days or last few series about one, what is OCD? How do you get treatment? Two, why is treatment inaccessible? The problems in the industry behind it. And then today we're talking about our lived experiences. You know, we're three people here who have all gone through trials with OCD, who have you know eventually found our way to treatment, and we just want to talk about our story and talk about the impact accessing treatment had on our lives. So uh, to kick us off in, in terms of introductions, Chrissy, would you want to talk a little about yourself and introduce um, kind of your story to the audience? Yes. Uh, first of all, I'm sweating. I went for a run right before this and then took a shower. So if I am periodically fanning myself, it's because it's burning up here. Although we are supposed to get snow soon, which is awesome. Uh, my name is Chrissy Hodges. I am an advocate in particular for Pure OCD, which is the nickname for the community that has intrusive thoughts with mental rituals, which brings me to my next point that I wrote a book called Pure OCD, The Invisible Side of Obsessive Compulsive Disorder. I own a company called Treatment for OCD Consulting, where we do peer support as well as, and we are we are certified peer support specialists in our respective states, and we also do referral consultations worldwide to help connect people to therapists and resources that can help them on their journey to recovery. And lastly, I'm the co-founder of, oh wait, not lastly, um, I founded and the executive director of OCD Game Changers, and I co-founded Peer Recovery Services which is a government uh, a company that owns a government contract that puts peer support specialists in the state institutions. Thank you, thank you, Chris. I, uh, Chris Ethan, uh, this is called opposing. <laughs> this is called opposing hands. By the way, it's supposed to make you look. Smarter. Is it working? Look, see what? Look, look what? It's supposed to make you look smarter. Is it working? I think you, you should put it over it. your head. You put it over your head. Oh, okay. Anyway, hi. What's up? My name is Ethan. Uh, my name is Ethan Smith. I'm the uh, National Ambassador for the International OCD Foundation, OCD Advocate, um, um, and, and, I, and, I, and I do stuff. Um, I'm also sweating because I'm overweight and walked to the bathroom earlier, so it's a little hot. Similar and reasons. in Georgia. I'm, I'm in, the humidity is, it's 100% humidity. Um, I uh, am a writer and director and producer by trade and advocate by heart. Ooh, I should keep that. That's a good line. Anyway. Um, I'll write so, it down. Thank you. Please do. Um, so yeah, no, thank you so much, Stephen, for, for having me and Made of Millions and Aaron Harvey and all the great work you guys are doing. Oh, great, great. Um, well, and my name is Stephen Smith. I'm the founder and CEO of No CD, and we provide online therapy for OCD where people can download our platform and do live face-to-face -face video therapy sessions with our licensed therapists who all specialize in OCD and ERP. And then in between sessions, when their therapist isn't around, you could access different peer communities and different self-help tools to give you support. And it's kind of like the idea, you know, when you need help the most, it's oftentimes in between therapy sessions when you have no one there. So um, personally have OCD as well. And, um, you know, I guess our, our real goal is can we drive better, can we better drive access to treatment given that, you know, treatment is what gets you better. And people oftentimes think you can 
just kind of magically have the thoughts go away and, and the OCD go away. But reality is to, to get better, you really have to take that first step into therapy, see an OCD specialist, and then, you know, learn how to become your own therapist. So that's our company's mission. And I'm really excited to be here today as well with, with Ethan and Chrissy, who, who have made a tremendous impact personally in my life. And, um, you know, especially in my road to recovery in so many different ways. But um, yeah, I'm just, I think this is a great series and, and we're excited to kind of kick things off. So to get started, um, you know, I think what we, we could do is first talk a little bit about, I can't even read that. It's for Ethan. It says, it's, I'm a writer, director, and producer by trade and an advocate by heart. Oh, perfect. Just wanted to let everyone know in case they didn't. Also, I want everyone to know that, that this is actually on my wall. It's not an overlay. It's, it's part of my wall. So just, just FYI. Okay. I'm, I'm really committed to, uh, to the cause. So. <laughs> okay, let's get yeah. to business. <laughs> so, do you have a tat? Do you, wait, real quick. Do you have a tattoo as well? Yes, but I can't show you where it is. <laughs> oh, and we just a know. shout out quickly to Jessica for tuning in, and Dr. Jason Spielman for the Anxiety and OCD Center of Florida. I think I got that right, but it's close enough. They just oh left comments. Oh, I live comments, so I just wanted to say hi to Dr. Spielman and hi to Jessica for being awesome. Okay. Yeah. Thank you all for joining. Um, so I guess today the goal is to talk about our stories, right? For there's a lot of people listening or who will eventually see this video who probably are suffering alone, who are maybe just finding out that they have OCD. They may just have intrusive thoughts and not really know what's going on. They may have just started having them and, and their life could be kind of spiraling out of control. And so I think those are the types of people that we want to reach, right? And those are the types of people that we want to speak to today. So, um, so with that, Kind of, Chrissy, do you want to kick us off and talk a little about your story? Talk a little bit about what you would say to people who are in that situation. Um, it's just in regards to whether or not they want to get ERP. Is that what we're? Well, yes. So people who um, are essentially just suffering and, and looking for answers, right? So we're talking to groups of people who who are suffering with OCD, who don't really know what to do and yeah, okay. what to do, where to go. And, and I think the good news about you know, learning from different people's stories is you can kind of understand where what they did to get better, right? And and that's that's our that's our goal. I was just clarifying, just in case I launched into my story for like ten minutes, so I'll um <laughs> just wanted to know. Uh, you know, this is something that I work with people all the time. Um, with peer support is helping to support people to make that next step of jumping to get help. Uh, not to go into, you know, kind of an, a niche area that keeps people from getting ERP, which are called, you know, the secondary fears of getting ERP, Ethan, just in case you didn't know. Um, but oftentimes, <laughs> uh, when you're living with OCD, it feels so real. It is an internalized experience of what you are fearing and everything around you adapts to, to that those internal feelings. And so what happens is it's you don't lose reality at all. But what happens is OCD and the fears become your reality. And, and I want to clarify that by saying that doesn't mean that the fears are real. A little reassurance. However, what happens is you start to feel like it's everywhere and it's all encompassing. But what else also can happen with OCD is that it can ebb and flow. And so where you might be stuck, and, and this happened to me personally for 12 years when I didn't know that I had OCD. This was back in the day before internet, and even before AOL and all that. I would go for periods of time where all of a sudden, whatever had been at the front of my brain, which was typically the sexual orientation OCD, the fear of throwing up, incest OCD, things of that nature, those would all of a sudden go to the back of my head. And I would think, okay, we're good. Oh, and scrupulosity too. I would, I would think to myself, okay, we're good. It's not going to come back. And that's because we're experiencing this on a day-to-day -day basis. And if we're gauging OCD as that kind of illness day-to-day, -day, yes, some days make us feel like this is good. I got this. Hey, I only suffered for 80% of the time today. So that was a good day. And I like to communicate to people, is that really enough? What do you deserve? You deserve to live a life where you aren't suffering 
all the time or waking up and really crossing your fingers and hoping that OCD doesn't show up. I, I lived that way for years and years and years until I finally found out I did have a diagnosis of OCD, unfortunately, through a suicide attempt. But then I also found out that there was treatment that really helps you manage it day to day. It turns it from, I don't want OCD to show up to if OCD shows up, I'm going to be okay because I have the tools and I can anticipate that it is going to be there and I'm going to be okay. And so I just, the, you know, the message that I want to leave in regards to what Stephen is asking is you often are surviving OCD and thinking that that is the best life that you can live when in reality you deserve to learn how to manage this every day. You deserve all the things that you want in your life without worrying that OCD is gonna show up and ruin those special moments. And it probably will show up anyway, but if you have the tools underneath your belt on how to combat it when it shows up, that can help you lead the best life that you absolutely are worthy of having. And so doing ERP, even though it was really challenging, it was really scary. I had all the fears of what if I do it and it proves the fears are real and what if it doesn't work and that means I had you know, the fears are real and what if my therapist doesn't think this, all of those things. Even though I had that, I was able to go through exposure response prevention therapy and it drastically changed my day-to-day -day life and how I relate to how OCD shows up in my world. And I do want to end with OCD does show up in my world every day. The difference is I'm ready for it now and I'm not afraid of it. I'm, I don't have to like it. And I certainly don't think my life is better because of it. But now I don't have to fear it every day and think that I'm going to slide back down that rabbit hole because of it. Mm. Yeah. And so Chrissy, what was that epiphany that you made that this basis said, okay, I need to go and do ERP. For me, it was, uh, I was diagnosed with OCD and uh, I was on medication and medic I'm very lucky the medication worked tremendously for me. It took probably away 80, 85% of my symptoms, which mostly was the depression of, of an exhaustion of dealing with the intrusive thoughts all the time and doing compulsions. And I made the decision after I got on medication of, oh, I don't need this. Look, I, I can outthink it. <laughs> like we all think. Right. I'll just outthink it and everything will be good. And within four to five weeks of getting off medication, the symptoms were back. I was back suicidal. And um, I was lucky back in the day. This was 1998, 1999. I can't remember what year. I was able to search AOL and I came up with Dr. Stephen Phillipson's website. And he, that was the first time I identified with the community of people that identify as pure OCD. And when I saw that, because I never really believed the diagnosis before that, I always thought it was hand washing and it was organizing. And I had sexual intrusive thoughts, violent intrusive thoughts, blasphemous intrusive thoughts. So when I saw that article, I felt like I'm not alone, that treatment could work and this man could help me. And I took the risk and lived with the uncertainty and he was taking patients. And I was lucky that he was able to do therapy across state lines through telehealth. And so yeah. I, that's, that's, that's how it happened. Yeah. And I did it over the phone, Stephen. I did not even oh, wow. know what Dr. Phillipson looked like. <laughs> wow. Wow. And so if you were to go back in time and, and tell yourself right before you started your piece, uh, you know, a, a piece of advice, what would you say? Um, I, I mean, I would say the same thing that Philipson said to me, which is trust the process in which I have to remind myself all the time. My hope for people who are listening to this, who may be an ERP or may be contemplating ERP is that's a, that statement is really hard to believe in the moment again, because OCD feels so real. The internal experience of it is what we are experiencing in relation to our everyday life, uh, I have to just trust those three words often, trust the process. And 
Um, when I look back, I, I, I understand how lucky and how privileged I was to be able to have therapy, but also that as a 20 year old girl, not knowing anything about this, there's hardly any information on the internet, how lucky I was to have a therapist that could really brand that into my brain. And I trusted him enough to go through with it. Wow. Well, it's great that you found that clinician and Dr. Phillipson is a tremendous person too. I know he's, he's also been on, um, many different videos that um, made of millions or, or it was branded as intrusive thoughts.org published. So I, you know, I, I would see his content as well. And um, well, the good news is too, Christy, is the, the fact that you went and sought treatment and you got better, you then you went and became an advocate. So what, what kind of prompted you to go and advocate then, advocate then for um, OCD treatment as well as, um, you know, ad, advocate for OCD awareness? So what prompted me is because I was lonely. I was living after treatment for over a decade, feeling like the only person out there that had had HOCD, that had had scrupulosity. I was, you know, would go in and out of periodical depression because of the stigma and the shame and guilt and the grief I experienced about my, uh, about what I had been through, the trauma I had experienced with OCD. And in my 30s, I experienced violent intrusive thoughts to the degree I'd never experienced them before in a major relapse. And I just thought at that point, you know, there was just this at the I think that there's always been an advocate in me. And I just was so blanketed by shame for so long. And finally, in my 30s, I just had enough. I wanted to find people like you and Ethan and other people in the world that experienced what I had. I needed to build a community around me and selfishly, even if it was, even if it was for my benefit, I also thought there's got to be a reason there's got, I, I, I've got to be able to give back in my experience as awful and traumatic as it was, I've got to find some sort of good out of this. And yeah. so I found the, the, the niche. I looked, Stephen, it was like 2011. There was nothing on the internet about, other than just, you know, graduate stories and things like that for people with pure O and sexual violent thoughts. And I thought I can fill that and I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to try. I was scared. I mean, it's scared to go on. It's scary to go on YouTube and start talking about pedophilia theme and, you know, the fear of being gay or the fear of being straight. It's terrifying. But I just thought to myself, if I'm feeling lonely, there are so many people out there that are feeling lonely and I need to do my part to give back to them and find them and let them know that they're not alone. Definitely. Definitely. And that sounds similar to what Ethan's doing now. And so I, with the, um, with all your advocacy work with the IOCDF, with, with um, even on your own account with, with game changers too, Ethan, do you mind talking a little about your story and, um, and kind of what's led you to become an advocate like Chrissy? Yeah, absolutely. I'll leave the dirty details. I actually put a link in our in our chat to my keynote speech. So if people want to learn uh, or hear the actual the details of my story, because I want to keep it fairly short, so people can. So if we, we want to put that in the comments, um, you can, Stephen. Um, sure. Anyway, so yeah, I was as early as I can remember. I had pretty substantial OCD um, when I was a kid. Um, it manifested very much in more traditional ways with symmetry and. And, uh, and having to be right and, and physical physical compulsions and things like that. But um, as I got older and got into high school, it started manifesting as uh, health anxiety. So I was taking my temperature hundreds of times a day. I was constantly worried that a headache was a brain tumor and a fever was meningitis. And, and, and it was slowly making my world smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. It was amazing. I even got through high school or graduated high school. Um, I went to college for three months, thought I had a brain tumor, dropped out. Um, and then my 20s, uh, even though I was acting and working, I couldn't, I, you know, my, again, my world was small. I couldn't do uh, the things that I wanted to do. And um, and eventually, you know, OCD took me out of the game in life at 31 when I had become completely bedridden and unable to function whatsoever. Um, if we backtrack a little bit, I was diagnosed at the age of 14 um, with OCD, but didn't receive proper treatment until I was 31. So 17 years before I found ERP. Um, and ironically, the study from 1999, the Harvard study, showing that it, and on average it can take upwards of 17 years for someone to find treatment. Um, I think since then it's gone down to 14 or 12 years, so much better. Um, but anyway, where uh, 
you know, so I fit right in that, in that, in that line there. Um, I, I think uh, most of my teens and twenties were spent like desperately looking for something to help. Um, so I was on every SSRI and medication uh, known under the sun. I did, I did every kind of therapy got so desperate at the end. In fact, that I was doing, I mean, past life regression therapy and hypnosis and Reiki and crystals and energy healing because like nothing else works. So what did I have to lose? Right. Um, and it wasn't unfortunately until my life was completely taken away from OCD where, where I was just unable to feed myself and eat and drink because I was so scared of my thoughts, how much I believed in the, in the, um, in my thoughts and the uncertainty, um, that, you know, we finally found um, a clinic that, you know, did, that did ERP. Uh, this ties directly into my advocacy. But the reason I became an advocate was because by the time I reached that clinic and had access to the help I needed, I had gone so long, A, reinforcing OCD behavior, being reassured, um, being, um, you know, uh, I'm blanking on the word, but being taken care of by people. So having my, you know, OCD constantly reinforced by the time I found the right treatment, I didn't believe it would work. I didn't have hope. I didn't trust it. Um, and so like, not only did I have like a, a mean case of OCD to deal with, but I also like mentally was just not in a space to believe, have any reason to believe that this would possibly work. Um, so, you know, fast forward, um, I'm fortunate to have had a number of therapists and clinicians um, that didn't give up on me and that tried a variety of things, uh, both ERP and outside of ERP. Um, got me to a, a really healthy place. Um, I, I never would have imagined that I would have ever been in a really healthy place where OCD, for the most part, doesn't play a big role in my life, though I still have thoughts. I still compulse here and there. Um, but for the most part, it doesn't interfere with my function. Um, but so the reason I advocate is because, you know, I strongly believe um, that, you know, nobody should ever reach that point where A, OCD literally takes over your life completely to where you don't have a life. Um, B, when you're ju you're just an excruciating pain, and uh, and and C, you know um, where where you have you can find treatment and get access to therapy that that is meaningful and helpful that you can be aggressive and take you know get the most out of. And so um, that's why I've been so vocal for now ten no not ten years eh, almost ten years um, just trying to get the word out uh, using my story as a cautionary of why people need to seek treatment. Go ahead. So I was going to ask, you know, in terms of just getting treatment itself, right? There's often people who are scared. They're saying, I'm, I've am i been failed so many times. I, I'm afraid that if I just take this next step, it's just going to fail me once more. What would you say to those people, given the fact, Ethan, that you, you were failed many times? Like, what would you say for those people who have tried everything, but they're, they're kind of on their last attempt and they're, they're now just kind of hearing about doing evidence-based treatment like ERP for OCD? Yeah, I think that the feelings are valid. And I think that, you know, we have to be gentle with those feelings and not discount the fact that you feel um, let down um, in many ways. The system has let us down. And um, and that's what things that, you know, Chrissy and, and Stephen are really trying to fix through peer support and through technology and, and cloud-based services. Um, I think that, uh, I think that we have to remember um, that we have to look at stories like myself, like Chrissy, like Steven, and really use, use those as proof of the pudding, so to speak, to let you know, to see people that are living better, manageable lives with OCD and saying, this is what I did to get better. Not this other stuff that didn't work. I did ERP. I did exposure response prevention. This is what works. Not only does the science show that it works, not only does the data and research show that it works. That's great. That's all well and good. But as a sufferer, I want to know for another sufferer that, hey, I did this and it worked. It wasn't easy. It was tough. Chemotherapy is miserable for cancer. It makes people sicker than the cancer itself um, in many cases. And yet it does work. And so, you know, if, if you're wondering uh, if ERP is right for you, if you've experienced other modalities of treatment that haven't worked, but you haven't tried ERP, I would absolutely say that ERP is is, is the answer. It is, and it's not easy. It's difficult. And even if you've tried ERP before and it didn't work, I just want to touch on sometimes 
you know, we ourselves can let ERP down. I believe very much in ERP, but I think we all have to be in the right mind frame to do it and to accept it and embrace it and our willingness to change. And, and, and Chrissy spoke on that a little bit, you know, um, she talked about, you know, trusting the process. And so, you know, we're being asked to do things that go in direct opposite of our fears and what our brain is telling us. And we're all pretty in, in, intelligent people. So that's very foreign to us. Um, the biggest thing that helped me with ERP was just radical faith. Like that was a term that really struck me is just embracing this idea that maybe I didn't know what was best for me, but the people that I were on my team did and just listen and say yes, because we complicate treatment. We really do. Um, yeah. But but definitely, and you don't have to take our word for it, you know, go see, search, search out other advocates that have stories about where they were before ERP and where they are after, because it's definitely yeah. a good, yeah. Yeah, and so here's a question, Ethan. So you went and you got ERP and you learned how to manage those. So what happened after you got treatment and you managed Like, What happened with your life? I mean, my, my life changed drastically. And, and my, you know, my, my story is unique to me and that, you know, I didn't necessarily have a straight trajectory of getting ERP and then I got better just because of my own experiences to that. Um, and so, and everybody's sort of got their own trajectory with finding ERP. I know, Stephen, that you responded fairly quickly um, once you found it, you know, and every, I think I'm correct in saying that. I could be wrong. Yeah. Um, yep. You know, and I, I think it goes to how old you are and how long you've been struggling and what you've been through and severity and, and all that stuff. But the bottom line is, after I finished my process, um, my, it, I always imagined two things. It felt like this, this cage door was suddenly open. Like I felt like I was in a cage the whole time and I did everything I could do inside this cage. There was just nothing more for me to do in this cage. And suddenly the cage door was open and I could fly out and the whole world was in front of me. And that was both really exciting and really terrifying, but way more exciting uh, to be right. able to, because you know, you know your potential. Like you know who you, even when you have OCD, you're like, okay, I know what I'm capable of if this OCD thing wasn't in my way, but this OCD thing is in my way, so I can't do it. Right, right. But suddenly when that's right. not in your way anymore, um, so it profoundly changed my life and, and, yeah. and, uh, go ahead, Steven. Oh, no, I'm just, I'm just listening. Oh, and I mean, in very practical terms, I went from living in with my parents for 31 years because I was deathly afraid of leaving their side. Um, I wouldn't travel alone. Um, I wouldn't go anywhere without my mother to, I moved to Los by myself, got my place, started my acting career. Um, um you know, I started yeah, living, living in a adult life for the first time, you know, in my entire life. So, you know, I was 30, 31, uh, I felt like I was 18 and, uh, and like the rest is history, so to speak. Yeah. Well, that's a great story. And it's, it shows that no matter how much you suffer, you can get better. Right. I mean, like, it seems like Ethan, you were at rock bottom and Christy too, you were at rock bottom for quite some time. And once you got to treatment, things drastically improved. Right. And I know, you know, ERP is a gold standard. You look at acceptance commitment therapy, look at mindfulness-based tactics as well. Those, there's new research coming out too, where there's, there's ways to, to manage using um, a lot of different modalities. ERP is the gold standard, but can you learn how to mindfully accept intrusive thoughts? And can you apply some of those principles to um, like response prevention? So, we're, we're, you know, there's a lot of hope today. I think that's the, that's the silver lining. And although OCD is torturous when you go through it, you can get better if you get to treatment. Uh, and so that's kind of my story as well. I know I've talked about my story several times now on this on this series, so I'll be very, very brief. But, you know, I, I think in relation to Ethan and Chrissy, <laughs> um, they both played an instrumental role in me getting better. So I think this this um, webinar is is interesting. Right. So when I was at my rock bottom, I had actually stumbled upon Chrissy's um, Chrissy's content online. Right. And so I was searching my intrusive thoughts. I had no idea that intrusive thoughts were OCD. I thought OCD was just a personality quirk. And I started to see kind of what this condition is really about. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's exactly what I'm going through just because of what Chrissy did. So kind of fast forward, I go through treatment, I get better. And then, you know, about a year from ending treatment, you know, I'm, I'm kind of back in school. All of a sudden summer, I have a big relapse. So who do I call? I call Ethan Smith. And I, I just remember this phone call very clearly. I was down in San Antonio, Texas talking with him and basically said, look, you know, it's not really a relapse because you learn how to get better. You can still get better and you can stay better. So, you know, just thinking about it, it's like, if you have OCD, you could really do two things. You can get better, you can stay better. And if you get treatment, it helps you do both. So although it's a chronic condition, although you will, you know, have OCD episodes um, throughout your life, you can, with proper treatment, learn 
how to manage a condition in such a way where it gives you back your your life before OCD or it gives you back the happiness in your life. And so for me, you know, OCD took me to rock bottom, but getting treatment helped me regain my life just to where it was before. And it made it's actually, in fact, made it even better because I can do things now that I wasn't able to do prior to, you know, going through OCD. So uh, the moral of the story is with treatment, you can get better. It's important, though, to access the right treatment, evidence-based treatment. It's important to see an OCD specialist. It's important to do therapy sessions with them. And it's important to, when you're not with them, to be your own therapist. And so we built a company, No CD, to help you do that. However, there's a lot of different groups out there that are that are um, supporting that mission, right? And so, you know, I think today we have, what, a handful of advocates who are doing a variety of different projects, whether it's Stu and the OCD stories, whether it's Chrissy, Ethan, Aaron, who's, who's obviously been um, running Made of Millions and has and is, um, had us here, in, you know, on this on this webinar. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people who are making a big impact, and so, you know, I, I encourage you all to to go off and, and who are listening to this to access um, evidence based treatment, you know, and then also to to go in and once you're you know you've gone through treatment, you've learned how to manage the condition to help others as well. So, you know, there's a there's a lot of great work people are doing, but I think it's going to take a village to really move the needle and help reduce that rate from 17 years to get effective treatment down to, you know, days, right? And I think we can do that given technology is is um, is kind of transformed the way information spreads. So with that, any questions? I know some we can we have one viewer who's listening can only hear a couple words at a time. Is that the case for everybody else, or or is is the audio working fine? I think it's um, okay. Well, please comment if you have any any concerns. Um, but just kind of to ask the audience, right? So you all listen to our stories. What can we do to help you? You know, I, I know OC treatment can be daunting. I know it can be expensive. I know there may not be OC treatment nearby. Uh, these are all challenges we've all faced before. Um, however, there's probably others as well, especially given the challenging times, um, given the COVID nineteen pandemic. So, what can we do to help you? Well, I would like to comment something first before sure. we get into that. I think it's it's probably appropriate to mention that one of the biggest reasons why people are not able to receive treatment or un even understand that treatment is available for as long as it is, is that the way that OCD manifests and shows up for people is not something that people feel comfortable typing into a computer. You know, the most common intrusive thoughts that I see in doing peer support are going to be about sexual orientation or or whether or not, you know, someone is, is going to snap and become violent or if, whether they're a pedophile. I, I can attest in my own story, even back in the day at the computer lab when I was when I was dealing with HOCD, which is, you know, the fear of turning gay. Again, it's not homophobia. It's just, a, it's where OCD attacks your sexual orientation. It's, uh, the last thing I was going to do was to type into the computer at the computer lab, am I gay? Am I, you know, did I turn gay? Is it possible to turn gay? And not because I thought there was anything wrong with that, even in the South, in the in the 90s, I didn't. Um, but, <clears throat> but more along the lines of I was afraid what I was going to find out. I was afraid I was going to find out that this was... <clears throat> This was the, the thoughts were real. Again, if I was if I was homosexual, I would have lived a homosexual life, and there was, because I didn't feel like there was anything wrong with it. But with OCD, you cannot get that certainty. And so, what I run into the most, and I think what keeps me, you know, like when I'm awake at 3 a.m. worrying, is how many people are not able to type into the computer things about, you know, am, did I am I going to hurt my kids? A, they're worried that people are going to find out that they've typed, they've typed that in, and B, because they're afraid of what they're going to find out. And I think that's one of our biggest obstacles in the community, which uh, I've only seen momentum in the last few years, is the ability for people to really start speaking out about the hard topics for pure OCD, the pedophilia, the sexual orientation, the violent, the you know, schizophrenia, things where if you're, you're scared to say them out loud because... I work with people with schizophrenia. There's nothing wrong with it, but it is a fear of people that OCD lashes onto. We cannot be afraid to say these things out loud 
in order yeah. to reach the people that are possibly losing their lives because they're too afraid to type it into the computer. That's where right. I think one of our biggest obstacles is. Right. And to add to that, right, the the challenge is because it, it's so misunderstood and it's so a lot of these thoughts are so taboo, a lot of per healthcare professionals have no idea what OCD actually is. And so they can't basically understand that, hey, ERP is really important. Exposure and response prevention is really important to treat OCD. And if you treat OCD, people get better really quickly and then their depression goes away, their de anxiety goes away. There's potentially even substance use disorders can go away if it's, if it's oftentimes covering up underlying OCD. So there's, there's a value in accessing this treatment um, that oftentimes gets overlooked by some of the, the leaders in, in our mental health field, which is, which is challenging. And that's why I think what that, you're doing, Christy, is so the OCD important. community too. I'm just going to be honest with you. Like yeah, you sure. never see, there's only a few people that go out and will bust shit out about pedophilia theme because they're too afraid that other people are going to think that they're pedophile sympathizers. But yeah. like the way that I look at it is come on now. Like this is one of the biggest themes that we have. You cannot be afraid to advocate to the people that really need it. And it's, right. you know, call to arms, call to action, like get over your ego, people. Like we got people to reach all over the right. world. We got to right. start talking about the hard topics. So we can get people to help. So how do you, how do you kind of expand? Oh, Ethan, you have something to say. No, I was just going to say there's a good question. Um, I didn't, but we can, there's a couple good questions. I thought they're worth answering. So right, check sure. out. My attention. No, no, <laughs> no. Do you want to pick some out? No, yeah, I just thought uh, Fernando's question at 4.34 p.m. Um, hi, I had a question. Uh, I keep hearing ERP in the conversation, but I have no idea what it is. I would also like to know which type of therapist is best for the OCD I have. There's two good points here. What is ERP? Mm -hmm. He also ends with the OCD that I have, which means yeah. his subtype. Mm -hmm. is, yeah, yeah, yeah. And is that a different type of ERP? So Chrissy, let's, let's lead off. You, you take the question. Oh, oh, okay. Um, I'll just give my thoughts and then I'll pass it off to one of you. Um, exposure response prevention is, um, it's a, it's under the umbrella of co cognitive behavioral therapy. And so what this consists of is exposures, which is what usually people hear. They're like, oh, exposures, I'll just expose myself and I get better. No, like RP response prevention is the biggest piece of ERP that's going to help you to get better. Um, I'm going to let one of y'all take that, but like, a little bit more in detail about ERP um, because the second question I definitely want to address. Um, it is important to know that it doesn't matter how OCD manifests as your theme. Um, with that said, I want to say, I, I want to say one more thing. ERP can treat behaviorally any theme that you have because OCD is OCD. I will say with some of the heavier themes, it, you, you might struggle a little bit with the shame and embarrassment and some of like those added layers of emotion around it. So pedophilia theme being one of them. However, that does not mean that you cannot get better um, from doing exposure response prevention. That's why it's important to go to a therapist who specializes in OCD, who does exposure response prevention. Sometimes a therapist who dually does acceptance commitment therapy can really help with some of those really heavy, violent, pedophilia themes. Uh, that way you can have more of a values based therapy experience alongside ERP. Steven, thoughts? And, yeah. One, one thing to add to. So which type of therapist is best? I mean, you'll oftentimes go off and say, okay, well, if I have OCD, I'm just going to go to the therapist right down the street. Mm -hmm. Well, because of the fact that most therapists don't have specially training to treat OCD, they often won't understand that you have to get exposure and response prevention. So a lot of us here have, we went to therapists who told us to like snap a ribbon on our wrist or told us just, you know, confront the thought and try to push it out of your head. Like some of these, the worst things that you could actually do. So when seeing a therapist, it's crucial that you find an OCD specialist therapist that has specially training in exposure and response prevention. So the, there's a great, um, couple of blog articles that we've created at Treat My OCD that say, okay, here's the, here are the questions that you need to ask a therapist. Um, you know, I know um, Aaron Harvey from Intrusive Thoughts that already had other um, articles as well that kind of talked about which therapist to seek. And so, you, you know, it's important though, you go and you, and you ask those questions because if they don't specialize in ERP, there's a good chance they won't know how to effectively treat you. And so at NoCD, we actually have all of our therapists um, specialized and trained to treat 
OCD with exposure response prevention. And Dr. McGrath, uh, Patrick McGrath, um, he is leading that as well as with Dr. Jamie Fiesner, our chief medical officer. So we we have clinicians that that um, specialize in ERP too. But again, just it's very important to go and ask the right questions. And as somebody who is the the person with OCD in this case, you have a right to ask those questions, yes. right? Don't feel embarrassed to go and ask your therapist or to interview them about these questions because it's your life that you're trying to regain. And um, if you ask the right questions, it's crucial. Ethan, do yeah. you have anything to add? I, well, yeah, because I think I said Fernando and her name is Fernanda. So I just needed to deal with that because my guilt was killing me. No, but Fernanda, I think this, this uh, the, the quick summation of that is ERP exposure, exposing yourself to your fears, your thoughts, the things that you're afraid of, response prevention, preventing the compulsive behavior, and instead learning to sit with the discomfort, the anxiety until eventually what's called curves goes down. And over time, the repetition of those things first calls you to habituate to where you're not responding the way you used to. Eventually, those thoughts and feelings start to take a back seat. It takes time. It's a process. It's not a, it's not a one, one and done uh, therapy at all. It's a lot like working out. It's the perfect example. I can't go to the gym and look like Steven overnight. That's going to take months and months. <laughs> I usually use Mark Wahlberg, but we're here with Steven. So it works out. Um, so that's, that's the short of ERP. Um, the other thing they're, they're spot on. Do you do ERP? If they, if they go, what's ERP or sorta or anything like that, run for the Hills, do not give them money. And lastly, OCD, although the subtypes and all of that is very important, the content ultimately is irrelevant in terms of treatment. OCD, uh, ERP treats every OCD, doesn't matter what the subtype is. It's specified to your subtype to help you learn the process. But what's amazing is once you learn ERP for whatever that is, you know, OCD, as we know, can be sticky and can switch themes. So a lot of people think when their theme switches, oh my God, I have to go, I, I don't know how to, I don't know how to deal with this. I'm going to relapse. When in fact, the skills you learned from ERP from your previous theme, you can absolutely apply to everything you're experiencing now. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Thank Drew you, G. Fernanda. Drew G. He sounds like a, uh, a quarterback. Like that's a quarterback name, Drew G. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just saying. Go ahead. So is depersonalization depression common when dealing with ERP? I never had these problems before. Does this, does the anxiety have to come out some way? So um, Chrissy, do you want to, do you want to answer this one? Um, so with ERP, um, I, I'm just going to substitute that with just OCD in general, just to go back to my lived experience, depersonalization uh, and depression. Absolutely. You know, it's just really common for people to experience depression alongside OCD. I've ha I have heard therapists um, say before, if you did not experience OCD, you would not be experiencing depression. And that was the case for me. Depression comes alongside OCD when I've experienced, you know, when I am dealing with intrusive thoughts and doing mental compulsions all the time i i get i become exhausted and when depression sets in it gets dangerous for me because i tend to have suicidal thoughts uh depersonalization you know i i can't, I, I may be incorrect on this but i usually link that to kind of dissociation i i get this question a lot in peer support because people feel very scared if they're depersonalized or if they're experiencing dissociation they're they're equating that to psychosis and then that becomes an intrusive thought. Uh, but for me, uh, it scared me the first few times I had dissociation and when things would get extremely heightened. I The experience that I have basically is it feels like I'm outside my body. It feels like I am I'm seeing the world from above myself. I can't feel anything. I'm very scared because I can't ground. I've hence used CBT skills to help myself ground and also to really psychoeducate myself to understand that when someone, when I am dissociating, it really is my brain's way of protecting me from the amount of anxiety and distress I'm experiencing. So that may not help in the moment. And I do, I maybe have some feelings. I disassociated at one point a couple of years ago and panicked and called my therapist and, and we, we talked it through at the next session and it really just helped to realize that, you know, it, it sometimes is a mechanism that our brains do to help protect us from extreme distress. Um, even though it doesn't feel good, it is something now that I anticipate to happen the same as OCD. I use it as part of 
uh, kind of my ERP strategies. If dissociation is part of heightened anxiety, I'm just going to anticipate it. So when it happens, I don't feel very scared in the moment. I'm just going, this is just part of my pattern and my experience with OCD. Yeah, that's awesome. Ethan, anything to add to that? I mean, no, I think Chrissy nailed it on the head. I, I would just add that um, I think those of us, I mean, we're very in tune with our feelings. A lot of it, I mean, most of us are, right? And the thing that you have to remember with ERP and really any of, the, any of these modalities of treatment is they're not feeling-based therapy. They're action-based they're action therapy. Sorry, that was my girlfriend in the other room. Um, that was really inappropriate to say. I thought it was funnier in my head, um, unless my girlfriend's a dog. But anyway, I digress. Anyway. So, uh, no, I meant like an actual dog. But anyway, so so um, no, like a, like a like a puppy. Like I'm just okay. Anyway. Yeah, that's nice. Cool. That's cool. Um, no, but in all seriousness, you know, ERP is an action based therapy, and what I mean by that is is we determine success a lot of times in life by how we feel. If we feel good, then we're winning, winning, winning thing. And if we feel bad, then oh, this isn't right. We shouldn't be doing it. The reality with ERP and anxiety and depression and all this stuff is we have to expect to feel lousy when we engage in ERP, especially initially. It gets worse before it gets better. So some just some like simple like ERP hacks that you can learn right up front that I learned down the line is that don't go into ERP and this process expecting for depression to lift and, and the feelings to get better immediately. You're not going to feel good and you're just not. But Learning that feelings don't have to dictate your actions is really what the secret sauce is to this, this idea that we can do these things regardless of how we feel. And once we learn that and we learn that, you know what, it's okay for me to do this week feeling like crap today, I'm still going to do it anyway. That's realization and becomes really effective. Over time, the feelings do come back into play, that you do start to feel better. That's the whole point, to feel good. But initially in the beginning and, and throughout the entire process, we can't really base things on feelings, you know, depressions, anxiety, all that stuff's going to continue to come up, but it's really based in the action. Definitely. One thing to add to it, you know, especially with some of the more taboo intrusive thoughts, you will feel like with going through OCD that you'll lose your senses, right? You'll lose your attraction. You'll lose your ability to love mm -hmm. all these different specific senses that you, you, you know, cherish. Right. And you know, it, for me, at least that was really tough and being like kind of, you know, in this position where I would live every day, but I wouldn't have those same feelings that I once had. And I was, I was putting so much attention on that until we you know started doing you know, exposure response prevention, specifically the response prevention, where I would, you know, learn to accept my thoughts as opposed to trying to push them away. And over time, what happened was once my anxiety decreased um, slowly, but surely, and I kind of was back to my normal self and um, the feeling started coming back, right? So mm -hmm. although you may have that sense right now, by getting effective treatment, you will regain those feelings. And that's, that's crucial. That's, there's, there's no better moment than when that happens, because you can then say, okay, I've just actually conquered something. It's something tangible that you can relate back to, to say, okay, well, two months ago, I was feeling this way. Now I came back and I have, I have these feelings again, really, really powerful. So that's what I would, would um, emphasize. That's a great point, Stephen. That took me back immediately to my own therapy. And I know I was so depressed that like, you know, when the, when the therapist would say, Hey, what are things that you love doing? What are things that are important to you? I was just like, nothing. I don't like anything. I don't feel like anything. I don't like anything I used to like, you know, and, and, and really just coming back to those things. You're right. The feelings in those spaces are in those spaces are irrelevant also. So even a great tool is if you're not feeling those things, look back and, and look at the things that you love, even if you don't feel it in the moment, if you loved writing, if you loved, loved playing sports, whatever those things were, use those as, as, as places to start. Even if you don't love it now, it's like, okay, well, I used to love going outside and playing basketball every afternoon. So even though I don't feel like I love that now, I'm going to go do it anyway. It's that whole bring the body and the mind will follow, and eventually it'll catch up with itself. Especially um, when it's sex. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm being for real. <laughs> to emphasize that right because like that's one of the things that you lose the feeling for the most is sex we have sexual intrusive thoughts and people often ask me should i not have sex because i'm you know i'm worried that when i'm having sex like you know i'm all of a sudden going to get a photo of my dog's butt when i orgasm or like <laughs> my dad or something but like the truth mm -hmm. is, is that that's part of the biggest issue is that that becomes just like steven said people often describe it as i'm feeling neutered 
And what has happened to me when I used to have the sex drive or I used to really love being with women or men or, or whatever you prefer. And then all of a sudden I've lost that. And that all of a sudden becomes the proof for people. And it's, I, I tell people, you know, you've got to take the risk and live with the uncertainty, like go have sex with your boyfriend, go have sex with your girlfriend and, and just anticipate that like in the height of an orgasm, something bad is going to pop in, but you can still have it. Why don't you just throw it out there? Like we all have boyfriends and girlfriends, Chrissy, and we could just go have sex whenever we want. Some of us don't, okay? <laughs> just saying. Be sensitive. There are means you can still masturbate. No, 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 no. <laughs> no. No. Well, on that note. I'm being yeah. honest. Like people also worry about um, masturbating. So we might as well just go there. Like <laughs> we're gonna then, have to change the name of this nonprofit to Made of Three. Um, everybody's oh, up. Oh, <laughs> you have a Luciana asked a question though. Um, all right, and uh, you can get it. All right, so Luciana asks, uh, <laughs> did you have to manage relapses? So I'll, I'll actually start with this. I think relapse is very interesting once you've had ERP. Um, I remember going out to LA after months and months and months of treatment. And it was really in a place where like, I hadn't, I hadn't had an OCD thought in months, honestly. It just, I, it just wasn't part of me anymore. And I go out to LA and I have new stressors and suddenly all my thoughts come back. And I'm like, oh my God, the OCD is back. I just spent all of this time and all of this money getting better. And now I'm relapsing. And so I called my therapist and, and I'm like, you know, all my thoughts are back. I have to come back to therapy, blah, 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 blah. And what he said is very crucial, which is, first of all, we have to understand how OCD behaves and what really is a relapse. The cool thing about ERP is that we're in complete control of our relapse, meaning that true relapse is based around action, not thoughts and feelings. So we can't control our thoughts and feelings. We can only control our focus and behavior. So the whole OCD cycle is two parts. It's the, it's the thoughts and the feelings, and then it's how we respond to the thoughts and feelings by compulsing. In those things, the OCD gets worse, we relapse. But if you've had ERP treatment, you have essentially some space between your thoughts and your OCD. And so ideally, you know, increase in thoughts and feelings is completely normal. And the behavior of OCD, and depending on stress, it can be a lot worse and not stress can be a lot better. So a lot of us going through this time right now with the isolation, the quarantine and COVID-19, our OCD thoughts are probably much louder than they normally are. I know mine are, right? But then the difference is how you respond to them. So if I choose to actively compulse on a regular basis, I'm heading in a path of relapse. Doesn't mean I will relapse. And the thoughts and feelings definitely doesn't mean I'm relapsing. But what dictates an actual relapse and engage is engaging in the compulsive behavior. So you have to do in order to relapse. Um, over time, if you do do, there is a chance you may relapse. And that's a very real, real thing. Um, the good news is if you've had ERP treatment and you've been successful at it, if you start, if the thoughts and feelings start getting really intense and really loud, I found for me that when I just shut it down, immediately shut it down, I just embrace whatever the thought is. Yes, I'm going to have sex with lots of kids. Yes, I'm going to hit somebody in the car and run. Whatever it is, I embrace that thought and just expose it right away. It shuts it down really, really, really fast. So yeah. relapse, let's be clear, relapse is not an increase in thoughts and feelings. And it's not an increase in OCD thoughts and feelings. Relapse is based on compulsions. And when you engage in compulsions and recreate that cycle that you were once in, that's a relapse. Yeah. Well, I think that's a I think that's a great note um, to end it on. I know we're running here close to that, we're almost out of time. Um, if there are any additional questions, please feel free to reach out to us on um, online. I know we're all online, and you know I guess to kind of end things, just really want to thank everyone for joining. Want to thank you all for the great questions and for listening to our stories. And if you have more questions too um, for Made of Millions, please feel free to reach out to them. Their team's incredible. Aaron Harvey's is one of our favorite people. I can, I can say that for everyone here because we've, we've all talked to her before. And um, you know, it's a really mission-driven nonprofit that is changing the way people understand different mental illnesses, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, OCD is one of those conditions that it's you just real, people just really need to understand it, right? And so I think what Aaron and his team are doing are, are, are kind of paving the way for that. Um, and we do one of these um, webinars every week. So next Tuesday, at, we have our, our final one of the series. And so please feel free to tune in. It'll be at 6 p.m. Eastern. And we'll actually talk about, uh, you know, what OC treatment is like from a clinician standpoint, right? What, what to um, what to ask different clinicians and 
And if for those who are curious, you know, you can definitely learn some things. So thank you all and very lastly, much. Stephen will, plug yeah. him. Stephen, will, Stephen will plug himself. So I am, if you don't have the NoCD app, definitely go to Google Play or the Apple Store and download it. Um, there's tons of amazing tools. It goes much deeper into ERP. And then you can access train clinicians. They, they're rolled out in a variety of states that are way more cost effective than in person. So if you're strapped for cash or if they're in a state, they're rolled out, you can find out all the details online, mm -hmm. but he's really changing the game in terms of access to treatment. Thank you. So thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, I'll just say thank you. Know, I really appreciate it. If you go to our website and you're just interested in learning more with working one of our therapists, you can book a free 15 minute phone call with our team, or you can just ask questions. You can see if it's right for you. Right. And, um, you know, our goal is to make OCD treatment, uh, you know, much more convenient, much more effective and much more affordable. So just because of the issues that I personally face, others on our team face, as well as others in the community face. So that's the easiest way you could, or you could download the app and you could, you could book that call right through the app and, and learn more there. So again, just really appreciative of the time, everyone. And Thanks excited for having for next week. I'm going to go repay right. my wall now. For all you do for us. <laughs> we Thank love you.